It's Tuesday, February 18th, 2020. Digital Trends Live is about to start. Here are some of the topics we're covering on today's episode of the show. Apple is in the news as they report that their revenue will take a hit from issues related to the coronavirus, while at the same time, rumors abound about a potential March product announcement. And on the same day, a Frontline documentary debuts about the rise of Jeff Bezos. He announces he is donating $10 billion toward fighting climate change. We'll give you the details of what that donation actually means. And you wonder why hackers want to get into our smart home security cameras while our own John Velasco went out and asked what he'll tell us what he found out in our smart home segment also as usual we'll have some fantastic guests joining us like ben resnick the markup manager for busygo a company utilizing artificial intelligence to help address the u.n sustainable goal of good health and wellness by addressing the problem of mosquitoes and the diseases they carry death to all of them all of this and more on today's episode of digital trends live Hello, this is Digital Trends Live, and again, thank you for joining us wherever you found us. We appreciate it. Hit that subscribe button. We broadcast live here every weekday, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, bringing you trending tech headlines, news, interviews, discussions, and so much more. All while broadcasting live across a number of different platforms. We're on Periscope, Twitter, Twitch, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Daily Motion, Apple News, two different mobile apps, a smart television app, and at digitaltrends.com slash live. So wherever you're finding us, you can join in the conversations that we get to have about technology, and there are a lot of them today, as usual. But to start off, I'm Greg Nibbler, here with Mr. Caleb Dennison. Good morning, Greg. Good morning, Caleb. How, How are you doing? I'm doing well, you know. Good. Got Excellent. here by the hair of my chinny-chin-chin, chin, as yeah. I often do in these mornings. Well, you know? I must say, your haircut looks fantastic. Oh, well, thank you very much. I want to make sure that that is noted, and maybe we can get a close-up of that later on. It's all for you, Greg. All right, let's talk about some tech, because there is a lot going on that we need to get to. And to start off here, let's talk about Apple. Apple really in the news, you know, after CES and Samsung being uh, such a prominent part of the news cycle for tech. Now Apple's here, but it's for something that we've already been covering quite a bit, uh, a couple of reasons. One being the coronavirus affecting their manufacturing and their revenue. So this is something that Apple came out and talked about in one of their uh, meetings, discussing how uh, the, the production factors and the manufacturing issues that are going on in China right now with so many other companies too, is going to affect Apple meeting their revenue goals. And this is just another sign of how wide reaching this, this really is. And it's not just revenue goals. I heard yesterday the words iPhone shortage were uttered. Yeah. And <clears throat> look, I'm, you know, I'm an Android user right now. I have been thinking about going to, back to the iPhone. Right about now is when I would need to do that. Uh, and if there's a possible iPhone, uh, look, I, I was like, I almost went to the cell phone store to just go ahead and get my iPhone 11 Pro or whatever I'm going to get uh, so that I don't <laughs> end up, right? you know, uh, a victim to this shortage. But iPhone blight. And yeah. I'm, I'm certainly no, um, I mean, I, I'm not on the edge of my seat over this sort of thing, but I can right. imagine that there are many who are. And just the, the I mean, if the revenue is taking a hit, that's because they're selling fewer iPhones. But when you go and you say the word shortage, yeah. like, uh, I, I don't know, that, that kind of could create a shortage. If people go and rush the, and buy the iPhones you can get now, uh, and then they can't backfill because they are having these manufacturing problems that that could create an issue. Yeah, and that's really what it comes down to is just the fact that they're not able to get these out because so many people in China, you know, so much of the manufacturing goes on there, but they're all at home under quarantine. Like, they're not even allowed to work right now. Right. So, they're, therefore, nothing's getting produced. And there was another report that came out actually uh, from Dun & Bradstreet saying that 51,000 companies worldwide have one or more direct or tier one suppliers in the impacted regions. So what that means is 51,000 different companies are going to have delays on that, and 5 million companies worldwide uh, could be hit by this just in this one little aspect. I mean, and I say little aspect because, you know, compared to the humanitarian crisis, this is, you know, it's a delay on stuff. It certainly affects companies, but it is a very big issue. And so that's one other thing, just showcasing that even Apple's getting hit by this. Uh, Samsung did have some reports, well, not some reports, but there were there was talk about how Samsung, since they have most of their manufacturing in Vietnam, mm -hmm. they may not be hit as hard as uh, some of these other companies. So a little right. bit of a difference right there. Uh, but yeah, that's that's what the report is. And it's just one more thing going out, you know, with this coronavirus and how it's affecting everything, especially after MWC. But there is some other things with Apple in the news. And this has to do with a rumored product announcement. So March 31st is what the rumor is when Apple may be announcing the iPhone SE2, the iPhone 9. We don't know what it's going to be called, but that lower end iPhone that they uh, that they you know kind of really sold a lot of that first time around. This could bridge the gap for Apple because yeah. typically when if you look at the product cycle 
once they get close to making the announcement, those phones are already made. They're in, right. a, they're in a shipping container. They're already uh, on, the, on the way over here uh, by way of, of ocean. Uh, so they should be landed and processed and ready to start shipping whenever Apple says they're going to start shipping their phones. So there's hope that at least the first batch of whatever this phone is, whether it's right. the SE2 or the 9 or whatever you want to call it, the lower cost phone, should actually be available. And that might help bridge the gap a little bit for Apple, but ultimately, I think we're all looking forward to the iPhone 12. Right. Um, and the question there is whether the announcement will be made on time, or if the fact that they're not actively making that phone right now, yeah. as originally planned, means that the announcement for the 12 could get pushed back. And of it's course, possible. with MWC canceled and us wondering, okay, you know, what are, is LG and OnePlus um, and HTC, what are they going to be doing in the phone space? Uh, how's their manufacturing impacted? The whole smartphone industry right now just kind of looks like a mess. It's def it really 2020 is. will definitely not be the typical product cycle that we're used to. You no. know? And iPhones are the one, that, or I mean, not iPhones necessarily, iPhones right now that we're talking about, but smartphones in general are what we're discussing. But that's because, you know, MWC was going to be happening there at the forefront of the news. That doesn't mean the other segments of electronics aren't going to be affected either. I mean, we just don't know yet about how all that's going to shake out. There's just not, this isn't the time of year for some big product announcements. So right. we don't really know later on in the year how that's going to affect people. Well, I'm waiting to find out, I'm waiting to find out if TV television is going to be delayed. Because yeah. though LG and Samsung, uh, Sony, they're all based in South Korea and uh, Japan, respectively. Um, you have other big players like TCL. Yep. high sense that are probably affected, even though uh, LG and Samsung are in South Korea, Sony, Sony and, um, in Japan, they get parts from China yep. that go into the TV. And, and if they can't get those parts, then you can't make the, the final product. So. It just shows what a wide reaching effect this is yep. having on everything. But we've got the details on this. You can check out more about it at digitaltrends.com and let us know what you think as we go forward uh, learning more about what, how the effects of this virus are going to change everything. Um, going forward, though, let's talk about some other trending news topics. So we have this Jeff Bezos in the news right now. And it has to do with a donation that he is making and a new fund he has started to help fight climate change. So, so Jeff Bezos has donated, uh, committed $10 billion to fighting this. This is part of his new Bezos Earth Fund that he has created, which it, ostensibly, he said, will explore new ways of fighting the devastating impact of climate change. It's an interesting move from somebody, you know, of Jeff Bezos' stature. I want to talk about just the Amazon impact alone. Uh, now, that's a lot of money, uh, certainly. I mean, that's nothing to... To snuff, I mean, ten billion dollars. That's that's tremendous. He is worth a hundred and thirty billion dollars. Mm -hmm. So by comparison, you know, it's it's not a large percentage of his money. But I mean, hey, ten billion dollars is ten billion dollars. That's that's amazing. He did just buy a hundred and sixty-five million dollar house in California. He did, which and is I like. Feel 0.05% of his wealth or something Of his like total, that. exactly. Or less than that, I guess. Yeah. And I don't think it did much to his company's carbon footprint, but certainly right. um, his personal carbon footprint went up a little bit. Um, interesting that he would make this announcement uh, at this particular time. You know, we're yeah. in a very uh, highly politically charged period. Candidates are trying to make a play. Um, you know, I do have to wonder if, if this doesn't help bring f climate change back to the forefront of the conversation yeah. with so many other issues being discussed right now. Um, so, yeah, but that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money, and hopefully it's going to do a lot of good. We'll, we'll actually be covering it a little bit later on in the show, too, but there's not a lot of details on what exactly that's going to be spent on or how it's being spent. But, again, $10 billion being donated, that's, I feel like, a, a good gesture, a good thing that, that's happening right there. There's a lot to cover as far as how Amazon, though, is impacting just, I was just gonna their say, influence on all of that. I mean, the... What, they've got to be the world's biggest shipper at this point. Well, I mean, there are several documentaries coming out in the very yeah. near future uh, about Amazon work conditions and everything else. I can imagine that um, their, their carbon footprint, their impact on the environment is going to be under deeper and deeper scrutiny yeah. uh, going forward. And you do have to offset it. Now, there are cap and trade programs, you know, where the idea is to try to Sorry about that. Offset the <laughs> my computer's chiming in. You know, normally it's muted, Greg, but not today because we're live and that's how things are. That's how it works. That's it's how we prove now. we're live. But no, the thing is, I mean, the idea is balance. You're going to have an impact. To try to balance it out a little bit. I think this is a Bezos way of trying to balance that out because I'm yeah. Amazon, as it grows and grows and grows, and and keep in mind that Amazon isn't just the company that flies the planes and drives the trucks and and uh, drives the vans that deliver the packages to your home. 
they're also housing massive, massive server farms. They're uh, yeah, one of, if not the thing. largest uh, cloud-based uh, uh, serv server farms. So, and they're all over the place. So they are gobbling up tons of energy. Um, you know, they have to, of course, keep those things cool. They're, uh, you know, they, they definitely have their impact on the environment. I think Amazon has to do this in yeah. order to, to, to make right with the world. Yeah, and, we're, and again, we'll see you know, how it all shakes out. We'll be talking to, uh, to one of our reporters here later on in the show who has a little bit more information on it, but uh, it is a coincidence. Also, yesterday, we spoke with the director of the new Frontline documentary, Amazon Empire, The Rise and Reign of Jeff Bezos, which mm. premieres today. Yep, so there you go. There's a little bit of a coincidence on when these announcements were made, but still, that's, uh, it, it, you know, it's a big move by Jeff Bezos and certainly $10 billion, I mean, that's that's pretty great, I would think. It's just how is that going to be used? We don't have all the details on that, but we'll talk more about that later on here in the show. And you can read more at digitaltrends.com. Continuing on, though, let's go to an Amazon-owned company, and that is Ring, who has certainly had their issues when it comes to security. We've all seen some of the things that have come out, especially over the last few months, uh, just issues with hackers getting into cameras, with third-party data being sold, with them uh, giving access to police organizations. Well, now, one of the things that they're doing is they have made this announcement today Day that they are enforcing two-factor authentication. So that that what they kind of brought up several times being like, well, if users had just used two-factor authentication, there wouldn't be any issues. So now they're kind of making it to where you have to so that when you sign up, you will get a one-time six-digit code sent via email or SMS uh, that will actually let you know um, when, when you're trying to log in. Too little, too late. Yeah. Um, although, you know what, let's not Let's not. Uh, the fact of the matter is, two-factor two authentication has very recently become just a requirement. You know what yeah. I mean? It's not really an option Im anymore. It used really to be is. that if you wanted that added layer of security, that added layer of assurance, you could uh, opt into two-factor th authentication, and you know you might feel a little bit better about yourself and your security. But now it's required, and I just think Ring left themselves open to exposure, their products were left open to exposure, and um, and I'm glad that they're doing this, but I feel like they should have done it a while ago. This seems like a, a switch they could have just flipped. Yeah, yeah, and it, you have to wonder why they haven't been doing it, and just all of that, that third-party data aspect, too, is just, why are you sharing the data? That's what I don't understand, to be honest. like. When it comes to something like this, where it's a service, you're already charging for it. It's not a free service, really. If you want, if you want to opt in to right. to having any kind of monitoring or access to your stuff, if I'm paying for it, don't share my data. No, like, just absolutely period, just not. Don't share my I data. mean, it's all fine and good to to say, well, listen, you know, by sharing some information with law enforcement, we're helping create safer communities. Well, I don't. I, you, I don't remember where I clicked the button that said, sure, go ahead and yeah. share my. Personal houses information with the local law enforcement. I know a lot of people who would be very, very uncomfortable with that. Yeah, 100%. It's one thing when you take like some video footage of somebody, a porch pirate coming and grabbing your package, and you, and you voluntarily share it out. For sure. Your, your own social media channels, you have complete control of that. But for Wing, Ring to just serve take it up, it. you know, yeah. and take it and give it where they want, I, that was such a bad move. Yeah. I, I don't know how, I mean, for, I have a very low opinion uh, of all of this, I don't know what the what the nationwide opinion is of Ring and all of this, but I have to think that their reputation has taken a bit of a ding with the public. Uh, definitely, yeah. And um, I am one of the people who bought the entire home security system before. Oh all this my goodness! Out, right before all this stuff started coming out, so, so yeah, this hits. This hits it hits. At home. Very close to right. home. Yeah, at the, the home. Like a week after I bought it all. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's what's going on with rings. They're trying to retroactively, uh, you know, fix some of these issues, I guess. But let us know what you think. We've got all the details at digitaltrends.com. And the uh, final story here just for the top of the news. And then we're going to have a little bit of, I believe we've got some read them No. Uh, that's a rumor. On a Tuesday? I heard that we have some read them Right after here. President's Day. I'm ready. Uh, but let's talk about this. So this is another uh, story coming out just with the further proliferation of electric vehicles, in particular in the pickup side of things. We have Nikola now announcing something, uh, saying that they've got a hydrogen electric pickup, so it's kind of a cross. Then, And the big thing here is, is one of them that they're teasing is that it could have a 600-mile range. A 600-mile range. That's huge. Yep. And there's a there's a look at it right there about what it could uh, possibly look at. And you know, they've they've made semi trucks before, but this is their pickup version and it's kind of an interesting move. It's, it would be called the the Badger. Yes. So, yes, uh, the Badger. Um so that's something that uh you know, taking a look at that. I, I think it's a 
I think that's a, definitely a, a great move if it's going to be a 600 mile range because right that's one of the big issues when it comes to this. Nobody knows how how far you're going to be able to go with an electric pickup. You have true. Although I, I I know I mean I use a pickup as a daily driver and yeah. so range is fairly important to me. Um, although frankly day to day I would never come close to using that much mileage. But if you want to take a road trip, if you want to hit the backwoods, you know, right. uh, you go camping or what have you, that would be really super useful. Um, I want to see this technology come to cars pretty soon because right. it would be a, I think. That would be an even better application of it, but It'd be big. let's also talk about the fact that it's a, an attractive-looking truck. Like, it is. I would totally roll that truck. I would not roll the Cybertruck. Sorry, Tesla, no way. Uh, <laughs> the thing is a beast, and it's <laughs> grotesque, and I applaud you, wow. but forget it. I'm not rolling that thing. I w this, this is a good-looking truck. You know? It is. It's a good-looking truck. And I love that... Uh, Nicholas coming out with this. Rivian is not going to let this com information come out and not react in some It looks way. very much like So Rivian's. much money is going into Rivian right now, and I feel like they're going to have to to hit back a little bit. Yeah. So it stokes competition, 600-mile range, awesome, and it's an attractive truck. I think that's a win. Yeah. There is an issue with the hydrogen side of things, though, uh -oh. figuring out where all that is. So, uh, well, you, know, you mean you being to able, to able to fill to up access. on it? Yeah. Yeah, California, absolutely. you're good. Well, the, it, I mean, I only got a, ch uh, a few min minutes to check out this story. Yeah, um, and it's that combo hydrogen and electric. So there is still another way that you can well, the, utilize it. Well, and it's not, a, it's not a hydrogen fuel cell per se. It uses hydrogen to generate electricity to run the electric motor, which tells me that whatever battery is on board would probably give you a reasonable amount of range to begin with, and the and hydrogen the could bonus. amplify it. So maybe it's not such a huge deal that uh, hydrogen is a little hard to come by for, for most drivers. Yeah. Um, the technology's existence, I think that's awesome. And well, I'm just going to leave it at that. And you can read more about it, of course, at digitaltrends.com. So let us know what you think on that. I know we need to get to a break because we have Read em and Weep coming up where we take a look at some of the comments that are trending across the internet and maybe direct it directly to us. It could happen. We don't know what it's going to say. So this is a mystery for us, too. You're going to want to stick around to find out what happens. All that's happening next here on Digital Trends Live. This is Digital Trends Live. Thank you for joining us. Wherever you're finding us, hit the subscribe button. That way you get notifications when we go live. So wherever, wherever you're on, just look for that subscribe button. Click it. Click it now. And then you're done with it. And that's your only job that you had to do. The rest is just enjoy the show. So let's talk about some read them and weep. That's what this segment's about. I'm Greg Nibbler here with Caleb Dennison. And we take a look at some of the comments that are trending from across the Internet as a whole. And we address them live to you right here right now we don't read these ahead of time so i really don't know what it's going to be nope nope so that's, that's why i lean in because i'm ready you I, know i can't wait to get into this we don't know what it is so we're going to have to find out together and that is one of the joys of this segment here for read them and weep and uh, let's take a look here bernie's tweets uh it's only bloody national drink wine day what a fabulous day the uh this suddenly is 
Yeah, so National Drink Wine Day. I didn't realize that. Uh, along with President's Day, perhaps? Was uh, that a that was co yesterday. coinciding yesterday? Yeah, yesterday, President's Day, followed by National Wow, Drinking Wine I was Day. so busy honoring uh, President Washington and President's past that I completely missed the fact that I could have just been drinking wine. No, it's today. You oh, it's today. today. Really? Yeah, today so is I did National miss Drink it? Wine Day. No. Fabulous. You've got the full day All right. to, to drink wine. Well, my plans just changed. Clearly, company policies dictate we have to celebrate internet holidays. I'm definitely not weeping over that. That is yeah. great news. We'll get a hold of HR. I'm okay. sure it's fine. We'll sure. put yeah. of course. Uh, Adriano and Paulina. Hashtag National Drink Wine Day, drink responsibly. And then a passed out cat. A passed out cat drinking wine. That is one drunk cat. That's one, that if I've ever drunk seen city. a drunk cat, oh. that is the cat right there uh, that has clearly had too much to drink. So please don't be like that cat. Uh, although that looks uh, looks like a nice setting. Yeah, you know, it's on the beach or something? I'm not sure. Well, so. Ray Carter regarding Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra versus the Apple iPhone 12. What to expect as a middle-aged white male. Oh, this is going to go good. Uh, I know my opinion doesn't count for much anymore, but that is some good hair. Whoa. Yep, Corey Gaskin. Corey, the Corey does game. have some good hair. Yep. Got to admit, Corey does. Um, I like how he had to slide in the, the why couldn't you just say Corey has good hair? Like, why did you have to add the other part in there? I don't know. I don't think anybody was busy worrying about whether, what demographic Ray Carter fit right, into yeah, no. within the construct of a YouTube comment, but that's fantastic, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, Corey. I'm nice going to start all of my reviews that way. Yeah. As a middle-aged <laughs> middle -aged white guy, I guess my opinion doesn't count for much anymore, but this TV's great. But these TCLs have great. <laughs> <laughs> At HDR, I got to tell you. Uh, where's my jerky? <laughs> All right. Will you anymore? Please do them all at your like a like a mobile home too. Hell That's yeah! You got to do all of them. You all bet. Them. All right, um, Alon friend. Uh, okay, what is 6G and how will it impact you? We break it down. Get some of those anti 5G hoodies and pants. Faraday fashion, baby. Yeah. Faraday fashion. Okay. More, okay. Uh, uh, anytime somebody starts talking about how. 5G is gonna yep. microwave your nether regions. I just get, I just lose a little bit of patience. Yeah. Like, studies are being done on this. There is no conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Like, it's gonna be okay. Yeah. Um, it's fine. You know what? <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say about that. Yeah. Like, um, I can't. I, I love the comments. Just go to our YouTube. If you don't follow us on YouTube, follow us on YouTube. Find any video where we explain 5G and just enjoy the comments. I mean, you can you can read for a good. You can kill at least an hour going through those things. You know, and and then the back and forths. Oh, it's so much fun. I think I have a new place to host that. Let's start a YouTube channel. Uh, it's just a webcam with a 5G phone plugged into the wall and two eggs sitting on top of it, and we just let it go for like two months. Okay, and then see what happens? And then, and then we crack the eggs open and see what happens. See what the 5G you did? They're gonna, is it gonna cook the eggs? I don't know. Is it gonna zap the huevos? I'll watch for two months though to find Sure, out. why not? Two months. And let them put the comments down there. There it Speculate is. Speculate over what's happening. We'll just put it right here. Because I'll if you're worried right about putting a 5G phone months. in your pocket, yeah. well, I would also worry about what was gonna happen to uh, those eggs. Your breakfast. You Chicken eggs, yes. loves breakfast. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is the 5G gonna do to breakfast? Throw a strip of bacon on there, whatever, you know. The public gadfly. We're going hashtag uh, lose an argument in three words, Greedo shot first. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, you Star drag Wars. That back up? Yeah, it's coming back up again. I thought, didn't they determine that Han shot first? I thought I so. I thought it was actually determined. Yeah. Like scientifically. Scientifically, and somebody asked somebody. Yeah. <laughs> and they said, yeah, dude, Han sh shot first. That yeah. I mean, totally. 100%. I, I am definitely saying that. But who who doesn't love a good debate? Just drag that back out. Bring it up. Bring it up. 5G everybody, and Greedo. I mean, this is a, this is a good day. There here. you go. And yeah. everybody drinking wine. Mm -hmm. and talking about that on the internet. Drink a bottle of wine and tell us about 5G. That's yeah. the next thing. Okay, regarding yeah. Apple won't meet its quarterly forecast because of the coronavirus outbreak. How ironic one virus canceling out a device with a virus. Yes. Yeah. It's a sharp observation there, Charles. See where you're going there. I see where you're going. I didn't see that coming. Yep, Charles. Charles online there. He's, you know, Charles Haney. <laughs> At Mr. Haney. <laughs> Mr. Haney, y'all being online and stuff. <laughs> Mr. Haney. With the comments and the tweets. Uh, we live in an awesome world today, Greg.
We do indeed. Mm. That's Freedom and Wheat. That's where we take a look at some of the comments from across the internet. And thank you, everybody, for joining us for those. We address those directly here to you. And coming up, we've got some more things to talk about. We're going to talk about some AI and how it's being utilized. We've got the founder and chief technology officer from Fluent.ai, so who is uh, Vic Ruth Tomar, who's going to be joining us to talk about their platform and everything they're doing. We've got plenty of things to talk about here on the show, including some more about Ring with John Velasco when he joins. But before we go to a break, we need to say thank you to Tenderfoot Caleb Dennis right here. Thank Tender you so much. Foot. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. <laughs> but, I'm it, trying to make that happen for some reason. I thought it was Tender Touch. Oh, it was Tender Touch. But I like Tenderfoot better. Tenderfoot. We'll make Tenderfoot work. I just kind of sneak up on you. <laughs> you never know where he is. There it is. All right, thank you everybody for tuning in. We'll be back after this with more Digital Trends Live. This is Digital Trends Live. Thank you for joining us wherever you are. We appreciate it. Hit that subscribe button and join the show. And we'd like to talk about trending technology and certainly something that we're all getting used to, well, or already used to, but we're seeing different utilizations of it, is voice recognition technology. It's really in so many different devices now, but what's it being utilized for and how can we utilize it in different ways? That's what we're going to discuss in part right now. To do so, we have Vikrant Tomar, who is the founder and chief technology officer of Fluent.ai. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, excited to talk about this. I want to give everybody a little bit of context to understand uh, your company and maybe a little bit of why it is you wanted to found this. Right. Uh, so Fluentia is a speech recognition company. In fact, what we call a spoken language understanding company. Uh, and our idea is that we wanted to really look at uh, how conventional technologies do speech recognition and where are the gaps and how do we fill those gaps. And the gaps being different languages that are support for very handful of languages that current technologies support. Um, the, uh, the current technologies break down in presence of noise or when there are accents. Really, that's, that's step one. And then where do we go from there in terms of personalization, allowing end users to teach their devices new things and, or really just create their voice interfaces into whatever they want. That has been the motivation behind uh, our company. And that really has been a big issue with inclusivity when it comes to voice recognition and understanding, you know, whoever's training it, not everybody sounds exactly like that person who's training it. So how do we make that work for, for everybody? And I guess to kind of give a little juxtaposition and comparison, um, you know, comparing your company to say Amazon or Google, what are some of the big differences between those? So there are two levels of differences. Uh, one is on the technology side, and the second is on the how the technology is applied, right? So technology side, all these companies, they do a two-step process. So what, step one is ASR, automatic speech recognition, that basically takes the input sound or audio and converts it into some sort of text. And step two is NLU, natural language understanding, to take that text and understand what they're saying, uh, what the person actually meant to say. What this is not necessarily a bad approach, but it doesn't necessarily fit in all the scenarios. It requires a lot of data, it breaks down in the noise, etc. And also privacy is a big big issue as well, because all of these models 
require a lot of compute power that runs on the cloud. Where Fluent is different is as, as we, what we do is end-to-end -end spoken language understanding. So directly extract that meaning from the speech of the person. And um, there are a few advantages on that is that our, our system doesn't have these separate disjoint components. Everything is integrated well together. This models end up being very compact and very small, uh, requires less amount of data. And the impact of that is that we can develop models in any language very quickly or models even in multiple languages. And finally, where these models are deployed can be very low power devices that don't necessarily need to send all the user data onto the internet. So it solves that or it addresses that privacy issue as well that we see so often these days, whether that's related to Alexa audio leaking or whether that's related to uh, the hired contractors reviewing uh, people's personal audios. So for you, a lot of that, that computing power and the, the software that's necessary to understand the language, that's based on the device itself rather than cloud-based as much as, as Amazon or Google are. Yes, so everything that we, we do runs directly on the device. We've spent a lot of time in miniaturizing our neural networks, optimizing them so they can run on really low power devices. Interesting. Well, looking at this you know, from a couple other standpoints too, because you mentioned privacy, so that would address some of that, I would imagine, since you're doing it right there and not storing that data. But since you're not getting that data, one of the arguments that I know that Amazon and Google always have is they need that data to train and to, to be able to expand the services. How does your company address that aspect? So, so that's a very good question. Um, you know, as technology improves, one of the things that is improving with it is how you can achieve same sort of results with less amount of data. So that's part one. And the second thing is how you can train uh, an existing model on device itself, so you don't actually have to send the data to the, to the cloud. So our models are, even though they're small, they're running on tiny devices, they are able to learn from the end user on those tiny devices and improve behavior for that user. And secondly is our models are able to learn up from up to 10 times less data than these conventional uh, approaches. So improvement in technology helps solve uh, these the other side of the privacy issues or other side of why everybody says like, oh, we need data. So it sounds like it's very uh, a great way to personalize you know, what's going on because, you know, we're talking about accents, everybody's got a different accent no matter where you're from and there are different ways that you say words, you know, and that it can actually understand that in different languages and really personalize it to that specific individual. Is that right? Yes, so, so you know, out of the box, the, techno the, the system works for everybody, but as you start using the system, it will learn, it will adapt itself more and more to your voice, to your way of saying different words, you learn from there. Yeah. Um, looking forward, well, I guess actually to start off before we look forward, let's talk about where Fluent is right now. So what kinds of devices are you in? What kinds of services are you in currently? Right, so most of our customer base currently is in IoT devices, smart home or smart hospitality. Um, so one example would be, let's say a smart conference room, right? So in, in homes, Alexa and Google is always listening. That Now that is not even a possibility in a smart office environment because everything that people talk about can have a very high degree of confidentiality. So you don't want that to go into anybody's cloud, right? So that's a very key market for us. Uh, the other thing is because we can run on really low power devices, and I'm talking about like Cortex M series of micro CPUs that run on tens of microwatts of power, right? So we can run in TV remotes, wearables is another key market for us. And, and then, um, uh, smart home wearable so but if you look at sorry smart home currently everything is centralized but as you see going forward things people are starting to look okay more at smart smart appliances how do you make your fridge or your 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 washing machine to or your stove to be a smart appliance in itself and directly that listen to the command on the device and decode the command on the device itself so that's those are some of the key markets for us that's where we're heading Interesting. Well, looking uh, going forward, you know, say a few years and just how voice recognition, I mean, how, just thinking about how far it's come, you know, just in the last several years, but to where it's at right. right now, you know, where do you see this in five years? You mentioned office integration. What are the kinds of ways do you see voice recognition being utilized? Right. So I think we'll, we'll see voice, uh, as, as you call them, voice user interfaces uh, up here all around us. So smart home is a good, good starting point. Office is next. Then, then in factory settings where these different, uh, let's say even a, a manufacturing plant, 
to control different devices inside that, to control different robotics uh, inside that. So that's definitely a uh, where we're going to see more and more voice applications. We already see some of those inside cars or, or uh, automotives, but the to degree the degree to which we will, uh, this currently exists will will evolve. Inside home, we have these smart remotes. Uh, some of our customers are talking about voice enabling the remote. So one remote can control different devices in your house, but it's this tiny remote that's where all the voice processing is running. Um, so, and then uh, another aspect on the on the um, business side would be to take meeting notes and things like this, which is a really hard problem actually because conversational speech is really hard. So that's a next step challenge for everybody who's currently working in speech. Yeah, that would be difficult with a bunch of different people talking at the same time yeah. and rechanging things. Yeah, that's definitely a challenge, but that would be such a great tool to have in a meeting. Right. If you can go back through and have that yeah. all written down. Well, I want to say thank you so much for joining us here, too, to talk about this. It's really fascinating and, and really fascinating to learn about uh, your company you know, and where you're at with it. But I want to let everybody know, too, if they want to find out more information, where can we direct them? Right. So, uh, uh, first of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity. If people want to... Uh, uh, find more information about us, they can go to our website, www.fluent.ai. Um, and uh, there, there is all the information available as well as uh, there's uh, our contact details as well. You can get in touch. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us here on Digital Trends Live. Thank you, Aaron. All right. So again, t learning about how you know artificial intelligence, but more more importantly, voice recognition, how it's being utilized, and thinking about it going forward, because that's something we're all using in so many different ways. We didn't even think about two years ago. Where are we going to be two, three, four years, you know, from now? And uh, talking about that integration of it. So definitely interesting. Up next, we've got John Velasco, who's our smart home editor, to talk about a few different things. He'll bring us up to date on some different uh, companies in the smart home industry. But also, he talked to a hacker well, a former hacker, to ask them why they were getting into smart home security cameras. Why do they want to get in? What are they after? Well, John got into that a little bit, and we've got that and more and different things to discuss here coming up. So stick around. Back here in a minute with more Digital Trends Live. Hello, this is Digital Trends Live. Thanks for joining us wherever you are. Hit the subscribe button. I know I always say that, but I really do mean it. Hit the subscribe button, that'd be great. And share the show, let everybody know about it. We like to talk about technology here, and right now we're gonna talk about smart homes, and I'm really excited to talk to our own John Velasco, who is joining us because he spoke to a hacker. Uh, that's part of what we're gonna discuss here today, but John, where do you wanna start off with this? So yeah, thanks for having me, Greg. So we know about Ring's problems with their security cameras being hacked. We have had several news pieces about it, um, specifically customer information that was potentially breached. Uh, that's what some of the lawsuits were, were alluding to. And then we also heard about a story about a hacker who was saying some inappropriate stuff um, using one of Ring's camera to this lady. 
And you know, there's just a lot of issues pertaining to the what I call the ring problem um, with hackers hacking to it. So I got down to the bottom of it and I started wondering why are hackers really hacking these security cameras? So to find out, I asked a security expert and interestingly enough, someone who developed a piece of software, actually it's a hacking tool called Sub7 and this software was used in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s. And it was basically a Trojan horse a program software that he did develop. And it allowed people to gain access to computers. So think of, you know, what, when you think of a typical hacker, this is the type of software you're thinking about. They'll gain access to a computer. Uh, they'll be able to do key logging. They'll tap into these webcams. They can even do some other stuff like uh, opening up your CD-ROM tray. So this author, this person who developed this piece of software called Sub7, he went by the handle Mobman, and lo and behold, it's this person. Uh, his name is Gregory ha Hannes. And right now, Gregory Hannes is a security expert. He works for a company called Viperline Solutions. So I tapped in, you know, I asked him, why are hackers hacking these security cameras? And I got to say, the, the answer was, was expected, you know, for me. So basically what he said was that I think right now people are doing it for kicks and giggles and they're just targeting solo. They're not making a big enterprise kind of deal right now or even targeting someone. So from, from that, he's telling me that these are people who just want to do it for fun. They're looking for you know, a good laugh at the expense of people. And, you know, honestly, that's kind of what it's been so far. If you look at the ring hacks, um, also yeah. with the little girl, if you remember that one um, where the creepy guy was talking to her, telling her, telling her that he was Santa. Um, you know, these are, you know, unfortunate events. But, uh, you know, Gr Hannes really makes some good points about how to prevent these types of hacks from hacking, you know, from someone who's developed software to hack. Yeah. So, um, you know, the biggest piece here is uh, two-factor authentication. And, you know, I, I'm pretty sure you use this, Greg. I know I use it in several things, whether it's to authenticate, you know, my bank account or even some, you know, security cameras. But Hannes agrees that most companies, all companies should use two-factor authentication um, as a, you know, extra precaution to protect your account. Because let's say for some odd, you know, Let's say somehow they are able to gain access to your camera using your username, your password. But in order to actually fully access the account and also tap into the camera, they're going to need that last piece of information that comes from two-factor authentication. So uh, he makes a point that you know Ring should have offered that from the beginning. Right. But to you know you know to Ring's credit, they they did start offering it recently to brand new accounts as an opt-out service. So, you know, instead of, uh, you know, you having a user having to set that up later on, it's in their face right now. So it's really interesting, you know, what he had to say. Yeah, that's a lot to, to take in just because, I mean, A, I find it really interesting, you know, because I guess that's kind of the route of a lot of these hackers or, or people who develop viruses. At some point, if they, they either, you know, go down one road or they end up working for white hat hackers and, and security firms and be like, well, I did it before. Here's why I did it, what I'm doing now. Um, which it sounds like that's the case with this guy, with uh, Gregory Hannes. So looking at it from, you know, people hacking in there to, to ring and different security systems now. So they, he's saying that basically they're doing it for fun. It's somebody who can do it. You know, some of them may be a little bit of a creep, but ultimately that's why they're doing it, just because they can. But what are some of the other issues that can come with that? Because I, I feel like, exactly. you know, that whole concern of when somebody gets access to our Internet of Things and then, you know, if you can ping from that, to something else, to something else, all of a sudden you have a control of an entire home network. I mean, it really is a pretty big concern. And is that something that he feels like these hackers are, are heading towards? Exactly. So, you know, it's a sobering realization where that's all going to. You know, he, he, wants to, he wants the companies to take more responsibility when it comes to safeguarding customer data, privacy from the beginning stages. Because if you look at what happened with Ring, um, they basically reacted to this problem. You know, as soon as they started getting all these, you know, news reports about their cameras being hacked, that's when they went, they went and went ahead and said, let's start two-factor authentication, you know, offer it. But 
Hannes points out, that should have been done at the beginning. Even during the development process, you know, making these cameras, there should have been some steps, some precautions. And the scary part is, Greg, is that, you know, he believes that, you know, these hacks are going to become more severe. Like you said, uh, Internet of Things, uh, everything in your home that's connected. And, you know, when a hacker hacks a camera, you know, the only time you'll probably realize that they're there or it's been compromised is if they have some sort of interaction with you because, you know, with the piece of software that Hannes developed in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s, um, he was able, you know, that piece of software was able to, was allowed hackers to gain access to webcams. And on the other end of the line, uh, people wouldn't even realize that, you know, someone's watching them or tapping into their microphone because it would appear as though it was turned off. And if you look at most cameras, indoor cameras, you look at it, you don't know if it's someone's watching, you know, well, you do know if someone's watching you because there's there's usually an LED light to indicate that or some sort of tone that will sit, you know, to help you, to notify you. But if you are a good hacker and you have the correct hacking tools, you could bypass those things and it would look like as if the camera was stationary, not doing a thing. And he quotes that he didn't see, you know, he looked up those YouTube videos and he didn't see someone getting robbed but he's convinced that it's bound to get there as you know technology enhances you're going to get higher resolution uh cameras that could potentially let's say you know read out you know uh, mail left on the table get right. some personal info they can know where you live and when they and if they know where the, you live and they're watching you in the camera they know when you're coming in when you're leaving and you know there's potential risk right there I mean, you think about that. Yeah, see something, you know, a piece of mail. But what about if you know somebody gets home at like 6 p.m.? Oh, what if they're ordering dinner? They're reading if they say they're reading out their credit card, you know, or something like that. That's exactly. Yeah. yeah, tapping in with the microphone, listening to that type of personal information. You know, there's there's a lot of stuff that these hackers can get. Um, and another point that Hannes made is that if you know, it's you know, people have cameras in their home for a reason. You know, for protection. You know, to you know. Uh, you know, check up on their kids, maybe their pets. And, you know, I get putting those cameras in places that you typically wouldn't, but Hannes suggests that if you're going to have a camera, just be mindful of where you place it because, you know, there are people who put the cameras in more private areas in their, in their homes, let's say bedroom, um, you, know, uh, you know, open spaces where you could see a lot of people. Um, Hannes points out that if you're going to have a security camera, obviously you want to be protected. How about instead of putting it in those areas, have it facing the front door where you know, like, if, uh, if someone's going to rob your home, it's going to come through that area. Right. Yeah, I don't see any good in putting a camera in your bedroom. I don't see where that's, where that's going to be comforting for anybody. Uh, but that's, uh, that's one of those things, too, just to kind of think about. Well, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, I guess the bottom line is, you know, in addition to those different steps, is two-factor authentication Absolutely. enough of a step right now for people to take? Uh, you know, there's there's still ways around it. If you look into the whole concept of social engineering, uh, I'm talking about these that the people who do this, uh, they're a little bit more sophisticated in their attempts to you know hack you because now in order to you know obviously you're gonna need to have someone's phone number, um, but there you know as, as far as two authentic two factor authentication, it's good. But if someone were able to say you know um, trick you into telling them what that code was. Let's say, you know, I have had a situation where, where some, where a hacker actually was able to get some, you know, detailed information, like a pin code like that, um, by, by making believe that they were at a Verizon store and their, you know, um, a friend of theirs was asking to send a, a number to them. So what they're doing is they're, 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 they're requesting for that pin code. It's being sent to that person and that person somehow believes that it's their friend and they give them that code. So you have to just be mindful and careful about, you know, this type, the information that you get and who you give it to. Yeah, I'm not giving any of my friends my codes. I don't care what they want to send me. It's not going to happen. But, uh, John, thank you very much for joining us, too, to talk about this. I mean, really, really interesting. And we've got this up at digitaltrends.com, too, for people to go take a look at and just like everything else associated with it. Uh, really appreciate you joining us here today. Thanks a lot, Greg.
All right, and again, that's John Velasco. So John is our smart home editor, and you can read everything else that he's got up there at Digital Trends. That's so much coverage, I mean, from the devices, but to these genuine security concerns that we have. And he went out and spoke to a hacker. I am looking forward to reading that article right now. Uh, well, after this show. We'll say after this show. So stick around. That's what you should do, too. Uh, so coming up next, we've got uh, some more conversations we're going to have uh, from Denton's. We've got Eric Tannenblatt. And Denton's is the world's largest law firm, but in particular, we're going to focus on autonomous vehicles. What are some of the laws and regulations that need to happen in order for those to get onto the road? We'll discuss that and more coming up next here on Digital Trends Live. This is Digital Trends Live. Thank you for joining us. Wherever you are, we appreciate it. Hit the subscribe button, and we like to talk about trending technology, and in particular, something we discuss a lot here are autonomous vehicles. We know so many different companies are developing them. The tech is almost there, but when are we going to actually see these on the roads? Well, there's a lot of regulations and legality concerns that come along with that. And there's a report that came out, the Global Guide to Autonomous Vehicles in 2020. That is from Denton's and from Denton's. We have Eric Tenenblatt now here to join us to talk about this. Thanks so much for being here. Hey, glad to be with you. Yeah, it's, it's you know, autonomous vehicles, we all get excited about the tech, but I mean, really there's a lot that needs to happen in order for this to go, and, and there's a lot that's covered in this report. Can you tell us just a little bit about, I guess, the report in general and what you went through to create this? Well, you know, Denton's is the world's largest law firm, and so we have over 175 offices in 75 countries, and we have about 40 uh, partners throughout our firm that are working with various uh, clients in the autonomous vehicle space. Uh, one of the things, as you mentioned, is the technology uh, is moving so quickly. Um, what we're finding, though, is that the technology is moving a lot quicker than our policymakers are in terms of putting the regulatory um, framework in place for autonomous vehicles to operate. Uh, and this is not something that's unique in the United States. This is all across the globe. So tapping into our resources all across the globe, we prepared a global guide to the reg to regulations that in, in a number of countries uh, around the globe. And in the United States, uh, we actually looked at all 50 states. And it, it talks about uh, a variety of things from uh, safety to cybersecurity to privacy. Uh, what you're finding in the United States is that we don't have any uh, federal uh, regulation. Uh, so right now there's this patchwork of regulation in all 50 states and eventually the federal government's gonna have to get involved. 
Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that's so complicated when you think about having the idea of artificial intelligence or essentially a computer controlling this vehicle out on the road. And like you mentioned, some of the different things, you know, that are concerns, privacy, safety, um, you know, whether they can be hacked. Uh, there's always the question of will it stop, you know, in time for, for somebody and all these concerns. What is the best way that you're seeing to go about handling this? Because if you have it from state to state, I feel like that's probably going to be a very difficult thing to implement. But you mentioned federal government. Is this something where the federal government needs to come up with a list of standards and then the companies fall in line or should the companies go to the government? Yeah, this is pretty interesting because historically the federal government uh, has regulated the actual vehicle and the states have regulated the driver. And in the case of autonomous vehicles, it's actually the car that is the driver. Uh, so what you're seeing is some states uh, are, are being very good about encouraging technology and advancement and are encouraging testing uh, in their respective states where uh, the federal government has remained silent. And uh, we almost had federal legislation that passed in the last Congress and uh, it died at the very end. But we're starting to see the federal government now uh, get more uh, engaged. Congress had a hearing last week uh, looking at uh, comprehensive uh, AV legislation. The Department of Transportation has actually taken some regulatory uh, action uh, just uh, within the last couple of weeks with Neuro, which is a, a service that does not transport people, but is used to deliver groceries and pizza and to allow uh, testing of those vehicles. And so they provided some exemptions. So you're seeing more and more uh, uh, activity from the government because this technology is coming and it's not gonna slow down and the regulation has to catch up with the technology. Yeah, it really does. And it's, I feel like that's kind of the case in a lot of different industries, but definitely autonomous vehicles being such a very important one because of, you know, it's a big giant vehicle on the road. I mean, really just comes down to that. It's is how safe is this gonna be? Um, looking at the report too, because you cover so many different areas, what are some other key areas that you think that people are really focusing in on when it comes to kind of getting prepared for this autonomous vehicle revolution, if you will? Well, there's a lot, we looked at a lot, of, a lot of testing is going on right now. I think that's probably the biggest thing you see. Uh, and there's also a lot of usage um, in, in areas that are in confined space. So you see testing of, of autonomous shuttles on university campuses or in corporate campuses. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, looking at 5G and telecommunications. I think that's going to be key as you roll out uh, autonomous vehicles. Um, the data privacy issues are so uh, important, cybersecurity. I mean, these vehicles, when they're on the road, are going to be able to collect so much data. And I think there's a lot of question as to, you know, what's going to happen with all that data. Not only are you going to have data as to where people are going, but these vehicles are going to be able to co collect data along the roads that they're traveling. Uh, and so uh, we're in uncharted territory. But I will say, you know, if you look back in the last four or five years, uh, there's been more investment made in autonomous vehicle research and development than the aerospace and defense industry. And so wow. this is happening. And so we just have to be prepared for it. Yeah, the point that you just brought up there, I didn't even think about that from the car's perspective with LIDAR and cameras. It's collecting all that information too. So that's going somewhere uh, when they're driving around. A absolutely. And I think you're also going to see autonomous trucks probably in the main before you see vehicles. I mean, there's a lot of shuttles that are being tested right now. But I think autonomous trucks, and I was just talking recently to someone about uh, um, sanitation trucks. And if you have autonomous sanitation trucks, the kind of information that they could be providing uh, for cities, uh, you know, where there are potholes that need to be filled, they could send that data back to uh, the Department of Public Works at a city, and then they could send a crew out to fix them. So you know, there's a lot of positive things that can come out of these autonomous vehicles. So people shouldn't be fearful of them. Right. Um, but, that's, but that's why I think there's a lot of testing that's going on and needs to continue to go on because I think people, uh, it's sort of fear of the unknown. And if people can see these vehicles out there and see that uh, they're actually safe, you know, 85% of accidents that occur today or may even be higher is due to human error. And when you have these autonomous vehicles, you take that out of the system that they're actually going to be safer. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's that's definitely the case. I mean, it's certainly if you drive around, you see enough drivers who are uh, clearly maybe it would be better if it was an AI running their vehicle than, than them. Um, use your turn signal, everybody. But 
Uh, one other thing I just want to get to here just before, before the end, and I want to direct everybody to where it is. I noticed that you studied you know, several different countries, and just from all of these studies, is there any one country that seems to be further along with their regulations than, than another one? Well, not to surprise you, but China is you know, very much uh, ahead of the curve. I think China, Germany, and the United States are the three countries that stood out in terms of the advancement, in terms of technology, uh, and putting uh, the regulations in place. But, but I, would, I would put, uh, I'd, I'd say China is probably uh, farthest ahead of all of the countries. But because of all the auto manufacturers in, in Germany, I think Germany is paying uh, close attention to what's happening in this space. The UK is, you know, they're, they're investing in 5G deployment, which as I said before, is, is going to be critical. But, you know, we've got a lot of technology in the United States. So I think the United States is another country to really watch. Well, the study's fascinating, and it's always fun learning about this stuff and just thinking about, you know, this going ahead. Like you said in the beginning, you know, this is happening. So it's just how we're going to react to it and how we're going to prepare for it. And for everybody out there who wants to read this study, where can I direct them? You can go to the driverlesscommute.com or to, the, uh, or to dentons.com, and you can look for our autonomous vehicle. We have a blog called The Driverless Commute. And not only do we have the Autonomous Vehicle Global Guide and a U.S. Guide to Regulation, but we also have a running news feed of everything that's happening in the autonomous vehicle space globally. So you can see as news breaks uh, in this space. It's an incredible, it's an incredible area to, to work in. And uh, it's, it's really exciting and there's a lot more to come. It really is. And thank you so much for joining us here on Digital Trends Live to talk about this. Excellent. Well, happy to be with you. All right, so there we go, learning more about those regulations. I mean, that is a really interesting standpoint. There's so many different concerns, but the tech is happening so fast, we gotta kinda catch up a little bit. So uh, that is something to really pay attention to, especially this year as we see more and more uh, government agencies trying to ta tackle that problem. All right, I know we've got more coming up here. We've got some more news for you here coming up after this break. I'm gonna talk about uh, some different breaking stories, but also uh, how you can take a flight on a SpaceX crew dragon capsule around around the earth i mean it's a whole thing that's going to be happening and you can do it uh, for a very low price of millions of dollars that's coming up next stick around back here in a minute with more digital trends live Well, hello there. This is Digital Trends Live. I'm Greg Nibbler. Thanks for joining us. Wherever you are, we appreciate it because we broadcast live here every weekday. And let's talk about some trending news right now. And I'm going to talk about a jetpack. Yep, a jetpack. This is what's going on. So here is a story. It's, it came out yesterday. And it has to do with a video that was showcased from Dubai. One of the crown princes of Dubai actually posted this on his Instagram page. And uh, what it shows is somebody with the full on, like I'm talking about the wing jetpack, that style right there, where you turn yourself into an airplane. And uh, it shows apparently this jetpack soaring nearly 6,000 feet over the Dubai skyline. 
And uh, what they're saying is that, you know, this is basically almost, uh, they're comparing it to like an Iron Man one. I'm not saying that's quite Iron Man. I mean, not if you have to have the wing on there, but it's getting, it's getting there. And this is from a company that is aiming to have 100% autonomous human flight by 2020. So they're looking at autonomy in there as well. So it's kind of a, an interesting story that came out and not a whole lot of actual details. Uh, but the launch pad was at the Skydive Dubai, and the video is really one of those big things. So here's something else they're saying, that the jetpack can reach speeds of 253 miles per hour and is controlled by a ground operator. So somebody on the ground is actually flying that. How does a human face stand up to 253 miles per hour? I mean, granted, you're wearing a helmet, but still, that seems a little odd on why you would want to go that fast, but I guess you can come up with some different reasons for that. Um, so the, the developers are Jetman Dubai. And they want autonomous human flight sometime this year is what they're saying. So right now, somebody on the ground is actually flying that thing and controlling it. And then they're saying eventually it'd be autonomous. So I guess you just strap it on and it takes you where it wants you to go. I, I always love talking about jetpacks or where that's going. There's certainly some different companies that are working on this stuff. Uh, but here we go right here. So this is another kind of demonstration. So again, it's in Dubai, as you can see right there. But look at this thing fly. I mean, that is pretty insane. I don't know if I would rather have control of it myself or if I would rather have somebody on the ground control it. Because right now, apparently, according to this report, somebody is controlling that on the ground. So somebody else is flying this guy like essentially a, a toy airplane, like a remote controlled airplane and just zinging him around everywhere. Um, but yeah, going up to 6,000 feet over Dubai. That's crazy. Uh, but that is what they're working on. So I guess in theory, this would be something that you would be able to go there and you'd pay like going skydiving you'd pay for a for a jet jetpack flight and that's what you would do so they're, they're saying that could be by the end of this year and we'll have to see if that actually happens the video itself is pretty impressive and uh there you go right there so showcasing some of the different aspects of it but that's that's pretty cool so that's one thing that came out i want to make sure that we talk about that because it is a trending story but that is a jetpack would you get in it i don't think i would I'm down to fly a jetpack, but I don't think that's the one I would get into. I don't, I don't trust it for some reason. I don't trust somebody with their controller. Like, what if they're not paying attention? Anyway, read more about it at digitaltrends.com. All right, continuing on here. We're trending news topics before we get back to some interviews and some stories we're going to tell. Let's talk about this. So we, we've discussed a lot about voice recognition technology and the utilization of that in so many different aspects of our lives. Whether it's smart homes, our phones, it's going into our cars, going into our workplace. But what if somebody doesn't want their voice recorded? There's the debate of whether, you know, you should tell somebody whether you have a Google Home or an Alexa device in your, in your home. Let's see there, I just set it off right now. But you know what wouldn't have set it off is if I had one of these bracelets on. So this is what we're talking about. This is a story coming out about a bracelet that is actually utilized to jam microphones on smart devices. So this is from the University of Chicago. This is a device they made. Clearly it's a pretty big tambourine looking bracelet that they have right there. Uh, but uh, what it could do is actually it sends out ultrasonic uh, frequencies, high frequencies that the human ear can't hear, but when, it, when a smart device hears it, it's just static. So if somebody's talking, you go back and record that. <laughs> I'm just reading what the, the lower third was there. Uh, you go back and record that, uh, it will actually jam it. And so they, all you would get back on the recording is just static, just static. So the theory is if you want to not be recorded and you can go out in public and clearly, you know, maybe they can make one that's a little bit more attractive to wear other than a giant bracelet that says, you know, well, it says a lot about you. But nonetheless, if you, you know, it's, it's essentially a tinfoil hat for your wrist. But if you can go out and wear that, you know, and, and actually jam these things, maybe that's something that we're going to end up wanting. I mean, if you think about voice recognition devices are going to be everywhere, everywhere we go. Things could be recording on a device. Maybe this actually isn't that bad idea. And there's also this that's out there. There's different companies working on glasses that will actually reflect infrared light. So when you have uh, facial recognition software, it would jam that as well and just turn it into a giant blur. Uh, but this is certainly a market that I think is going to be growing pretty, pretty big here in the next year or so as people start wanting to fight back against this because you're not going to stop the voice recognition devices. You're not going to keep facial recognition from happening. It's going to happen. It's going to be out there. But things like this are what could actually prevent them from recording your voice. So even though I made fun of it, maybe the tinfoil hat people were right. And this is what we're all going to be heading to is wearing those on our wrists. But you can read more about it at digitaltrends.com. All right, final thing is this. Who wants to go on a space flight? I do. So here's what we're looking at right now. 
This is actually from SpaceX. And uh, we know that SpaceX has a goal to send people into space. There's the Japanese billionaire who's going to go on a trip around the moon, still looking for a lover to join him. So, ladies, I'm sure you can still apply, although he said he's not taking applications. Uh, but uh, this is another announcement that they made. So starting in maybe at the end of 2021 or early 2022, according to them, SpaceX is partnering with a company called Space Adventures to send people into orbit. And so they've got, I believe it's four people, four privately paying space tourists who uh, allegedly have signed on to do this or, or are going to sign on to do this uh, to take a crew dragon capsule. No, that's the one that SpaceX wants to use to send people to the International Space Station. Maybe even later this year, they're going to start uh, actually doing human test flights in this, possibly as early as May or June. But this would be the one that you up in. So you go up in the, in the Crew Dragon capsule and you actually orbit the Earth at a very, very high altitude above the, the um, planet. So this would be, it looks like uh, an altitude, well, the ISS is 250 miles up from, from the surface of the Earth. And they want to go even higher to that, maybe two to, three t two to three times higher. So you get this very wide view of the Earth while you're up there. You would orbit for a few days and then you would come back down. So this is something that they're saying is going to be happening. Now, we've had, we've had individuals go into space before, go to the International Space Station. There was a company called Bigelow Aerospace that sent people to the International Space Station for the low price of $52 million per person. No word on how expensive this is going to be, but they are planning to do that. They said the training for the mission would take a few weeks, so you'd have to take a few weeks off of work, which I'm sure, you know, with your $50 million job or whatever it is, I'm, I'm sure you can tr probably arrange that somehow. Uh, but that is something that they're going to be doing, and uh, I want to go. So there it is. You can read more about that at digitaltrends.com. All right, I want to thank everybody for joining us here because we've got a lot to talk about. And uh, up next, I'm actually very interested in discussing this, and it's essentially the utilization of artificial intelligence and computer vision to address some of the UN's sustainable goals of good health and wellness. And I'm talking about mosquito control. Controlling mosquitoes, and that's what we're gonna be discussing next. We have from BusyGo, Ben Resnick. We're gonna take a quick break. We'll be right back here with more Digital Trends Live. This is Digital Trends Live. I'm Greg Nibbler, and I appreciate everybody who's joining us here today. And we love to talk about tech for change. And what I mean by that is tech that is helping humanity in some way. And we're going to discuss that and more right now. I'm very excited to talk about this platform and what they are doing. To do so, we have Ben Resnick from Zigo, the Marcon Manager. Ben, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Um, utilizing tech for, for good purposes and actually to help control issues that we're dealing with in the environment, I think, is a very fascinating use case. But I want to give everybody just kind of an understanding of what Zigo is and what kind of your mission is as a company. Sure. Well, everybody hates mosquitoes. Yes. Not everyone realizes how much of a threat they actually are to humanity. Um, a book came out a few years ago said that more people have been killed by mosquitoes and the diseases that they carry than any other cause in, in the world, in the history of humankind. Uh, a million people are killed by mosquito-borne diseases every year. There were a dozen cases of dengue fever in Florida this year, and Massachusetts almost shut down Halloween because of EEE, equine encephalitis. 
See, and that's, I mean, it's just crazy how much is transmitted by them. I mean, you think about Zika virus and, and everything else that can come from that. And controlling them has always been an issue. I guess, let me ask this, like, just to kind of sum up some of the different ways that we've tried to control mosquitoes before, obviously pesticides. What are some other ones? Well, the most effective thing right now is putting a mosquito net over you, but then you're sort of stuck in bed. You can't go anywhere. You're stuck under this net. Yeah, and that's, you know, you can't really, I mean, if I could, I would walk through society with a giant net over me, but that's really probably not very practical to do. So let's talk about Bazigo and some of the different ways that you're looking at tackling this problem. Sure, well, first of all, we are an indoor solution. We're not going outside and zapping every mosquito that's out there. Right now, what we're doing, we're protecting you in your own home. Our co-founder Nadav, when he used to go to bed every night, his father used to spend five or 10 minutes looking at every corner in the bedroom before he'd go to bed, just making sure there were no mosquitoes flying around. And if his father didn't check, he'd wake up with mosquito bites in the morning. And we don't want anyone else to have to go through that. So what we do, we track, we have a uh, Zigo device in the corner of whatever room you put it up in. We track every mosquito that flies into the room. As soon as it lands here, you can see a demo. When it lands, we send you a notification to your phone. If you look, usually mosquitoes like to land on the ceiling or towards the top of the wall. And you can see the Bazigo device takes a laser pointer and outlines exactly where the mosquito lands. Once you know where it lands, it's really, really easy to kill. They just sit there waiting for you to get them. We like using these extendable zappers. Costs about five bucks on AliExpress. Uh, I want one of those. Um, the, okay, so that's fascinating. So it's tracking. I want to walk through the tech on how this works. So you set one of these up in a room. So it's really, it's, it's per room is where you set one of these devices up. Exactly. And exactly. We how is it tracking? Mosquitoes. Sure. We, f we find mosquitoes up to eight meters, 26 feet away. We are using AI vision technology. We're not actually looking for something. We're not looking for a picture of a mosquito. At 26 feet away, we're looking at something only one pixel tall, one pixel wide. So what we're doing, we're actually tracking the movements, the flight patterns of the mosquitoes. As long as it's flying around, we track it. As soon as it lands, that sets off the notification and it sets out our designator so we can show you exactly where it landed. So that laser kind of square that just went out there says, hey, it's right here. That's that's where you want to go kill it. Um, can, does it differentiate between other kinds of insects or it specifically targets mosquitoes? You know, we're focused on mosquitoes, but actually we will track any fly, anything that comes into your room. You don't want it there. We're going to help you get rid of it. Um, Looking at it, you know, something like this, and, and I know that there's kind of a personal story with you, too, that has to do with mosquitoes and why you hate them as much as I do. But wh what was some of the inspiration for you to get this, get this out there, get this out there for people to use? Well, like I said at the beginning, mosquitoes kill a million people a year. And even if they're not killing people, even if, you know, in America, there aren't so many people who are killed by mosquito-borne devices, but they get sick. There are people who itch. Um, there's something called Skeeter syndrome, people who are very allergic to mosquito bites. And for the rest of the world, no one likes waking up in the middle of the night to the buzz of the mosquito. It, it itches, you lose sleep, you lose concentration. For me, when I go to bed, turn off the lights, suddenly I hear a bzzz, yeah. jump out of it, slam my door because I don't want the mosquito flying into my kid's room. And then I spend 10, 15 minutes just looking in every corner of my room trying to find the thing. If I just had a bazigo, I would know like that. Yeah, know exactly where it is. Well, looking at the device itself, you know, and thinking about where it's being utilized, how is this um, something that can be utilized, you know, outside of just a bedroom, or where do you see this software going? Exactly. So we're starting with mosquitoes because they're the huge threat, but there are all sorts of things you can do with this. You can put us in a dairy farm, put us in a barn, um, help stop all sorts of bites that might reduce production and productivity for cows, for horses, um, put us in a greenhouse 
and generation two is actually going to send out a mini drone to kill the mosquitoes or other flies autonomously put us in a greenhouse and stop using pesticides wait a minute what so you're gonna have a drone that'll actually come out and follow along with where that is yeah you gotta explain that just a little bit more <laughs> okay generation one which is coming out next year 2021 is designating the location of the mosquito right now if you go on to bzigo.com you can reserve a your device for nine dollars we'll give you a 30 dollar discount when we come out next year that's generation one that will find the mosquito for you generation two which will be about one year later we will kill the mosquito autonomously by sending out a mini drone it'll fly out from the device kill the mosquito and then come back so that it can charge and be ready for the next one. I love it. All right. I'm uh, fully on board with this. Well, I, and I want to let people know too, you know, for, if they want to go, you know, find it, you just, you just mentioned it, but I want to let everybody know again, just where they can go to do this. So these devices will be coming out next year. You said for a $9 deposit, you could reserve one. Um, what's the best exactly. place for them to go do that? Go to bzigo.com for now. Um, next year, when we're a bit closer to production, you know, you may see us on Kickstarter and other places. Well, I want to say thank you very much for joining us to talk about this, you know, and it's a really interesting use case of technology and and trying to solve some of these bigger issues and problems that we have. And mosquitoes, like you said, kill millions of people. Like, this is a big issue, and this is a, a great way to start, you know, trying to keep that under control, at least in your own home. And I will be, uh, I will be funding that. So uh, I want to say thank you very much for joining us here on Digital Trends Live. Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. All right, so again, looking at technology and different ways that it can actually help some issues that we have. So that's uh, Zigo. Take a look at that. Coming up next, we have Maya Schwader, who's going to be discussing a little bit more about this Jeff Bezos uh, $10 billion climate change donation and fund that he has set up. So what does it actually mean? Uh, we're going to dig into that a little bit more. She's got a great article up at digitaltrends.com, but we're talking to her next right here on Digital Trends Live. This is Digital Trends Live. I'm Greg Nibbler. Thank you for joining us. And we like to keep you up to date on what is going on in the news, in particular with technology. And a combination of both is what we're talking about right now. So Jeff Bezos made the announcement that he is going to be setting up a $10 billion fund to fight global climate change. But what does that exactly mean? Let's talk about that right now. We've got Maya Schwader joining us and her article's up there at Digital Trends. You can dig into it. But thank you for joining us. So what exactly does this mean when he says he's going to donate $10 billion? Yeah, excellent question. No one really seems to know yet. Let, I mean, let's be clear. $10 billion is not nothing. That is definitely a lot of money. Uh, but it amounts to about 8% of his total wealth, which would be the equivalent of, like, if someone had, you know, 13000 he, He's worth about $130 billion, according to Forbes. So if someone had, like, $13,000 in their bank account, this would be the equivalent of them donating, like, 
$1,000. And this is compounded by the fact that Amazon for the past two years about, according to several reports, has paid a big goose egg zero in federal taxes, despite being valued at around $800 billion. Um, so he's also been very scant on the details of where these $10 billion are going to go. In his original Instagram post, he talked about wanting to partner with you know scientists and activists and NGOs to see where this could be best put to use, uh, which is a pretty big announcement to make if you don't really know what you're going to be doing with the money. I would be very interested to see Jeff Bezos' DMs right now. Right, yeah. I mean, it's just like, hey, I've got $10 billion. I want to work with you, whoever you totally, are. Totally, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so he's setting this up. And again, you know, we don't know a whole lot of details about this, which I think is one of the interesting things. I mean, I guess that one of my questions is, why is he making this announcement right now? Like, why out of all times is he saying, here's $10 billion? Is there any indication of that? It's a very good question. I mean, we can all agree, us here, that climate change is an extremely, extremely uh, pressing problem. Um, he was, we have to say, we have to put this in the context of what happened at the end of last year. So in September 2019, Bezos came out with this climate pledge for Amazon. Um, he said things like, oh, we're going to be completely carbon neutral by, I believe he said 2030. Uh, we are commissioning a fleet of electric vans that are going to be part of our last mile delivery service that will eliminate 4 million tons of toxic waste from the air. The problem with this climate pledge that a lot of activists I talked to told me was it was also very vague on the details. There were not a lot of um, just incremental goals that one could track Amazon by to see that they were actually keeping to this pledge. Uh, no timeline, no way to hold them accountable. Um, now, I have a statement from Greenpeace in the wake of this announcement, and they said that uh, they await, they, they're eagerly, eagerly awaiting the details about what this type of project is going to be, but there are a lot of immediate steps that Amazon could be taking to address the impact that it already has right now on the planet. You know, it's funding of companies that drill for oil, it's massive data centers that run on fossil fuels. The fact that they seem to be expanding their, uh, their cargo deliveries by planes, which put a lot of toxics, uh, a lot of toxic air into the atmosphere. There's also been a lot of internal pressure within Amazon from this group, Amazon Employees for Climate Justice, uh, which has caused a lot of controversy and really pushed Bezos forward to uh, making this climate pledge at the same time as Amazon was trying to crack down on this group to prevent them from speaking to the media. So there may be some push and pull within the company there, uh, but it also just seems like, you know, it's tax time. Bezos is uh, coming out with this $10 billion as Amazon is preparing to perhaps not paying any, any taxes again. Yeah, uh, the timing is just kind of suspect to all of a sudden do this right now. I mean, you want to say, oh, he's just, you know, it's a magnanimous donation. He wants to really fight it, but eh, it's hard to trust Jeff Bezos and Amazon. You know, it's hard to trust, Absolutely. you know, <laughs> that they have everybody's best interest in mind. Um, I think this, just to ask just a little bit, too, to explain for people, is this Amazon Employees for Climate Justice organization. Do you know when they started up and are they public within the company? Or are they all kind of anonymous within Amazon? They've been around for, oh, I want to say uh, around a year now. I think they, they went public last spring. Um, they, they are public within the company. They have written many, many open letters to the press, to Jeff Bezos with their names and their titles signed to it. So it's not just warehouse workers. It's also people who are data scientists, people who work in these data centers, people who are programmers. Um, and it's a few thousand of them. There were several thousand names that were signed to an open letter uh, last September pressuring Bezos to come forward with this climate pledge. Uh, they've been very active on social media and they in many ways are risking their jobs because Amazon is not happy about the existence of this group and has come forward with um, really trying to put the kibosh on it to, to put it kind of bluntly. They have threatened them with their jobs. They've threatened them about speaking out to the media. Uh, and yeah, these people are really sort of taking their, their careers into their hands trying to get Amazon. And it really is just kind of a small percentage of Amazon's workforce. Uh, but they have been very vocal in holding protests and working with local environmental groups uh, to try to push Amazon towards this more green path. Well, it'll be interesting to see what does come out of this. I mean, after he made this post, has there been any follow-up from him, from any kind of inquiries, or it's just, hey, here's my Instagram post. See ya. Yeah, we haven't really heard much. To be fair, it's been a day. So again, <laughs> his DMs are probably a mess right now. And I'm sure, you know, he's Jeff Bezos. He has a million assistants. 
let's give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he's working with some people to decide what the best way to spend his money would be. Uh, but yeah, it, we'll have to keep a close eye on this and see, you know, if he actually comes out with anything interesting and if Amazon sticks to their climate pledge. Right. Well, it's definitely an interesting story and you've got the, the whole scoop there at digitaltrends.com to take a look at. Maya, thank you very much for joining us to talk about this. Thank you. All right, again, uh, talking about, you know, the Jeff Bezos, $10 billion for climate change. And well, that's going on. I mean, I don't mean to laugh at that because it is very important. It's a very important donation that he's making, but it's just kind of the lack of um, clarity on where that's going to be going, I think is one of the issues that really comes down to a lot of times with Amazon on what they're going to be doing. But I want to thank everybody for joining us here on Digital Trends Live today. And, uh, you know, we are always here bringing you up-to-date news. And tomorrow on Digital Trends Live, we'll have Duncan Greatwood, the CEO of Zage Security, who will be joining us as uh, joining us. So as a consumer and businesses continue to connect more and more devices, a greater level of security is needed, and Zage is working to solve that. We'll also have fish brains. That's what I said, fish brains. So Johan Atby, CEO of Fishbrain, the leading social network for anglers, will be on. They have 6 million users just in the U.S., and uh, that is something that I did not know about beforehand, but there you go. So we can do that and take a look at that tomorrow. All right, lastly, John Rowland, the president and co-founder of S2A, will be on discussing how luxury homemakers are joining the green movement and improving the efficiency of these massive homes. So this is it, and I want to say thank you to everybody who's joining us here on Digital Trends Lab. Again, we broadcast live here every weekday, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, bringing trending tech headlines, news, interviews, discussions, and so much more. So hit that subscribe button, share the show. We'll be right back here tomorrow with another edition of Digital Trends Live.